All right, guys, let's kick it off. Um, we got a lot of stuff to cover today. So please make sure you guys are focused, paying attention, take notes if you can. Um, we're going to go over a few things. Before I start, I just kind of want to give you uh, just kind of some of the things that I want to focus on. I want to focus on the buyer broker agreement, the different agreements that EXP has that we're going to be using going forward, um, when to use those, how to use those, and also the listing agreement that EXP came out with. They have a revised version of the listing agreement, which is a lot easier than our current listing agreement, and it all kind of ties into the changes that are happening. And then we're going to go through a script of how to talk about the buyer broker agreement, um, especially when you're like meeting people for the first time, these Zillow flex calls, people that you're going to go show a home and like try to introduce the buyer broker agreement to them, because that's going to be the new norm, right? As we go show homes, if you get a Zillow flex call today, you need an agreement signed to open the door for them, right? So that's, that's a big change to our process from what we're used to. Um, so it's important that you know how to present that information because if you don't present it the right way, you'll scare some people off, right? They may not want to meet with you. They may not want you to open the door for them. Um, and then also just keeping in mind that there is going to be, since this is all new information, the consumer is not going to be up to date yet, right? Their own, the consumer, we like we're in this, so we know the changes are coming. The person that's buying a home isn't watching the news every day, following every article up to date in the trainings. So they're going to be understanding the information as it rolls out, right? And there, there's going to be a lot of misconceptions that some consumers have. So it's important that we come from a stance of educating people. If that's the biggest thing you can take away of how to be effective with these new rules is you have to come from a stance of educating people, right? We're not here to defend what's right or what's wrong or how it should be or cause any sort of confrontation. Well, hey, it's good that they're doing this because now you know, blah, 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 right? Like your opinion, your opinion really shouldn't come into play with this. I would shy away from talking about opinion. I would more talk about educating. Hey, let me educate you on what's happening in our industry and how this might affect you. Let me, let me educate you on your options, right? On the different ways to go about it. Let's see what's best for you, right? Because if you start, you know, talking about opinion and what you think and what's right or what's wrong, that creates conflict with the client. And you're going to push more people away than you are going to get to want to work with you. You guys understand? Um, so education is the key, right? And in order to educate, what does that require from you? Knowledge. You need to know what you're talking about so that you can educate them, right? And so I really, really want to reiterate, guys, that it's not just here in the classroom that we're going to get this stuff down. It's you guys taking the necessary steps to study this on your own. Like we'll do some studying here, like, you know, but after you, like, I don't expect you to learn all this stuff right now. I've been keeping up to this, got up with this since this has started. I've been on several masterminds. I've looked at the documents. I've slowly been educating myself to where now I feel I have a good enough knowledge base to teach you guys. But it took me some time, right? Because there were some things that I wasn't sure about, you know, so it's going to be the same thing with you guys. You guys got to educate yourselves. Um, so that you can be able to consult your clients in the best way. Uh, okay, so really quick, does everyone have their laptops out or uh, laptop or phone or whatever, just a way to access the tools? I want to show you guys first where to find the tools because that's the question I, I'm going to get. It's, hey, Enrique, like, where was that thing you talked about in the training, right? You could do it on your phone too. Um, but I just want to I just want to point you in the right direction so that you know how to go find the information because that's going to avoid a lot of like, just repeating the same stuff over and over, right? So does everybody know that we have a tools page, right? How do we get to the tools page? Who knows the URL? My. Yeah, realestateprg.com slash tools. What I've also done, guys, going forward, what I'm doing is I'm using the real estate PRG URL and just putting the word in front of it. So tools.realestateprg.com, that'll take you there. Um, so for all these different like forms and resources, it's always going to be the word dot real estate prg.com. These are all subdomains because then it's just easier for remember. So like when we track our numbers on Tuesday, it's track dot real estate prg, tools dot real estate prg, right? Uh, listings dot real estate prg, contracts dot right? It's going to be all that so that you guys can easily remember, right? Um, 
And so you got to know how to get there first, right? So if you haven't been on our tools page, I'm just going to show you really quick. You go to the tools page, tools.realestateprg.com. Or if you want to like actual, the formal URL, it's slash tools, right? Same thing takes you to the same place. But when you scroll down after you get past kind of leadership, um, past our schedule, you get to team resources. Uh, and team resources is where I put all the shortcut links for all the different things that, that we have. And so um, one of them that we're going to go over, if you look at coaching and training at the very bottom, it's buyer broker script, right? So the script that we're going to talk about today, that's the link to the script. You click on it, it opens up the script for you, right? Um, the buyer presentation, right? It's right here, the newest one, the newest listing presentation. So as I revise things and as we update some of these presentations and contracts, they're all going to be hosted on this tools page. And so before you ask, hey, Enrique, where's that at? Where should you go first? Go to the tools page first, right? I want to teach you guys how to fish, right? I'm not going to fish for you and then give you the fish and cook it for you and everything. I got to teach you guys how to go out there and figure it out on your own. Is that fair? Okay. Um, and then EXP stuff. This is the next little section right here. At the very bottom, you'll see new EXP buyer seller forms. So if you click that link, it opens up what we're going to train today, train on today, right? And then if you click on EXP NAR toolkit, this is their whole like training center around all the stuff for the NAR stuff, basically all the changes going forward. And there's a ton of stuff in here, guys. Like literally there's millions of links, there's videos in here. Like you could spend like a couple hours just going through everything. So if you ever need information, guys, you need to know where to find the information. Right, because that's the way you're going to get good at. It. Uh, okay. Any questions on how to find the information? Um, and then I encourage you guys to kind of continue to go through this. Like these are other links. I put the buyer's broker script down here again under foundational trainings. It's the same thing, but just so you can't miss it. But these are all links to videos that we recorded. So all these train, like this training video, is going to be recorded, and then it's going to be on a link right there. Right training video on the new contracts, boom. So then when you come back, you click on it, it takes you to the, the training video hosted on our YouTube, right? And then, so when you guys are asking each other, like be able to point people to where the stuff's at. Is that fair? Okay, cool. Um, all right. So before we get started, what I wanna do is ask you questions first. What sort of questions do you guys have just from your under your general knowledge of what you guys know about the changes, are there any sort of questions that pop out to your mind that you want to make sure that we cover? Okay, so specifying on the RPA seller to pay X, right? Okay, I'm going to write these all down because I want to make sure we cover them. Um, what other questions you guys have? Any sort of questions that stand out to you? I'm sure you'll come up with some as we talk, right? But if there's anything that right off the bat, you're like, hey, I want to make sure you cover this. Mm -hmm. Yep. The other question was, okay, let's say buyer, buyers or the buyer and the buyer agent going to negotiate compensation between them. Mm -hmm. How will the buyer's agent get credit or something like that? Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, that me that's more around like, how is it negotiated? How is the fee negotiated between, yeah, buyer, agent, seller, right? Between all parties, basically, right? Okay, we'll cover that, right? That's a good question. Um, any other questions I see in the chat? Um, when to secure the agreement before or after the meeting? That's a great question, Andre when to secure agreement. And that's gonna be more about strategy, right? And we'll talk about that. Okay, any other questions that come to mind really quick? Okay, is there anybody that just feels like completely lost? Like, hey, I have no clue what's going on like on August 17th. Okay, and that made, that kind of made sense, right? Okay, cool. 
Um, uh, raise your hand if you're like, Hey, I pretty much know what's happening. Like I, I got a good understanding. Maybe I'm not an expert, but I pretty much know what's, what's going to happen. Okay. Um, raise your hand if you're like, uh, I'm not too sure. I know commissions are changing, but I'm just not really sure how it's going to work. Okay. Raise your hand. If you're just not going to raise your hand, like you didn't raise your hand for any of them, Deb. So which one are you? Okay. So guys, remember in order for me to teach you guys better, I need you guys to participate. Right. You got to raise your hand. Right. Uh, okay, cool. Fair enough. So let's address the questions first. Right. And I want you to keep in mind the strategy that I just did on you guys. Right. Cause I did that yesterday. Right. Before I start my presentation or what I'm going to teach you. Hey, Mr. Client, before I go into my buyer presentation or before I go into my listing presentation, I got a lot of information for you. I want to know what's important to you guys. Right. What are some of the questions you have that you want me to answer? And you make sure I cover. Right. That's what I just did on you guys right now. Cause I want to make sure this is a valuable training, right? If I'm just talking about all this stuff and I'm not answering the question that's important to you, there's a disconnect there, right? So just a sales strategy. Number one guys that you guys could take away. Dan saw me do this live on a listing presentation yesterday on zoom is always ask them what questions they have that are important that you want them. You want to be covered in your presentation before you even start talking about your presentation. Because then what you'll realize is that you'll get to like the meat and potatoes of really what their concerns are. And then after that, like you could just breeze through everything else. And like some of those things don't even matter to them. Right. And so we did that yesterday on the listing. It's like, all right, we attacked their questions first. And then after that, they were like, eh, yeah, it's cool. It makes sense. Keep going. And it was like easy peasy. Right. Um, so that's just a little trick. And you guys should ask that to your clients, whether it's a buyer, whether it's a seller, when you're meeting them for the first time. Hey, what sort of questions do you guys have about the new rules that are coming up? Has anybody taken the time to explain to you the changes that are coming up on August 17th between buyers and their, you know, how they tour homes and their agents, right? Um, so specifying on the RPA seller to pay, right? That was the question that An Antonio had. Let me uh, unshare really quick. So you... Okay. So yes, you are going to specify on the RPA. That's all going to be up to you, right? And so what I'm telling my buyers is that, hey, Mr. Buyer, this is my fee. I charge 3%, right? Let's say 3% is my fee. This is our agreement. You got to pay me 3%. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to negotiate that the seller pays for that on your behalf, right? As part of the offer. There's a couple different ways that that can happen that I get compensated as your agent. Either you pay me directly or either the seller pays us through negotiations and we ask for a credit towards my fee or towards your closing costs, basically, or it's a combination of both, right? The seller may say, okay, I'll pay 2%. And then, and so that means we're going to have to work out the other 1%, right? And so, but my job is to get you the best deal possible. And so if we can get you a deal where all your costs are paid through the deal, do you see the benefit in that? And they're going to say yes, right? Through the buyer, yeah. So the buyer would be responsible to pay you because you're what happened before, right? Before August 17th, is you see the property on the MLS, they tell us how much they're offering, we submit, that's what we're getting paid. Right. We're getting paid two and a half or three or whatever it says. Right. One or whatever the builder's offering. That's the old way. The new way is you meet with your buyer and you tell your buyer up front, this is my fee. We're signing an agreement. Right. The, li the listing agent meets with their seller and says, hey, this is my fee to sell your house. Not the buyer fee, just my fee as a listing agent. So there's two separate agreements, two separate fees. Right. The listing agent's fee could be three percent to list your home. The buyer's agent fee could be 1%, 2%, 3%, whatever that is, it's negotiable, right? Obviously, we're going to try to train you guys to try to get the most amount of money as possible, the most amount available, right, for that particular transaction, but it's two separate fees. So now when you submit the offer on the property as the buyer's agent, it'd probably be in your best interest to try to negotiate that fee through the offer and say, hey, Mr. Seller, here's a million dollar offer but we're asking for a 3% credit towards the buyer's costs. I have an agreement for 3% with my buyer. I ask for 3% credit as part of the offer. That 3% covers my fee. 
So now the buyer doesn't have to come out of pocket and pay me extra. If through negotiations, the seller says, hey, we'll pay 2%, the, the buyer still owes you one, well, then that's going to be a closing cost for them when they go to close their deal. Now, can you work with the lender to credit cover some of their closing costs? Yeah. Can you negotiate with the seller? I mean, with the buyer at that point and say, hey, you know what, Mr. Buyer, I'm going to help you out. I know you. they only covered two. You still owe me one. Just pay me half a percent and we're cool. It could be no negotiable. So you can go down. You just can't necessarily go up, right? You can't increase your fee. Now, what I did learn today, because there was a training today, and I think you guys should watch it um, by EXP this morning. It was like at 8 a.m. What they said is that you can have multiple fee structures on your agreement. So you can have your buyer broker agreement to say, hey, on a resale property, my fee is 2.5%. If it's an off-market deal, my fee is 3%. If it's a new construction, my fee is 4%. But it has to be spelled out and it, and it has to be clear what the fee is. You cannot say, hey, my fee is between two to three. It can't be like a range or anything, but you can list multiple scenarios, right? And that is allowed on your, uh, on your agreement. It just has to be spelled out clearly, right? It's on the back. Yeah. So that's actually a really good thing, right? Because you might have some clients that are, uh, let's say they're thinking about new construction and then they're also thinking about, you know, a regular resale property and the the commissions might be a little bit different, right? Maybe the new builds are offering 3%, but maybe on a resale, they're going to have to probably pay and you only want to charge them two. So you can put, hey, I'll charge you two on a resale. I'll charge you three on a new build, right? And so you can specify those things. And so it leaves it open to you being creative. Or let's say you have like an investor you're working with and they want to, you to find only off markets. And like, that's like a lot harder of a job because you're trying to find all these off markets you're door knocking, you're, you're cold calling and like, hey, I'll find you an off market, but that's going to be more work for me. So I'm going to charge you 4%. So I can do an agreement. Hey, if I find you an off market, my fee's 4%, right? If I find you an off market flip that is going to make you $200,000 profit, my fee's 4%. And so you can get specific with each different type of buyer. Now, let's say it's your family member and you want to hook them up, right? Hey, I'm only going to charge you 2%, right? My fee's 2 now, can you go back and amend the agreement? That was something that I learned today. Yes, you can. But it has to be in writing and it has to be both parties agree. So like if all of a sudden, like you're doing resale properties and then all of a sudden they're like, you know what? We're just going to go after new builds and we know new builds are probably going to pay more or whatever. And we had a 2% agreement. Hey, we're going to amend our buyer broker agreement. So now for new builds, it's 3%. So I'm just going to change that. You guys sign, we sign, we're all in agreement. Okay. Now we move forward. So you can't amend it. You can't amend it. It's the same way that you would amend any contract, right? Like if you decide to change the term, the price, as long as everybody is in agreement to it and it's signed and it's in writing, then you're covered. All right. Yeah. Um, let's say you and your buyer, your buyer's agent, you guys get to an agreement for a 2% commission. Yeah. And then you find a home and the seller's agent is actually giving you 2% as well, right? That's a total of four. Can you up it and keep all the percentages? You can't, like they're trying to, they're steering away from doing something like that where you can't just kind of be greedy. Right? So you have to be really careful with that, right? Well, what would happen is if your fee is 2% and then the seller is paying two, then that just covers your two. Oh, you can't keep that. Yeah, you're not adding two and two and you get four. Right. Because then you're kind of like bait and switching the, the client a little bit. Right. Like you're, you're being opportunistic. Like, oh, hey, let me like try to grab that extra two. You can't do that. Right. That's where you get in trouble. Yeah, you can do that. Or you can say or you can say, hey, the, the key point here is, guys, you got to be transparent. Right. You can say, hey, Mr. Buyer, I know you're paying me, too. The seller's offering an extra two. So with that extra two, we don't want to lose it. So why don't we split that, right? Like 1% will go towards your closing costs. And then I get to, if I can get that 2% for us, I get that other 2%. Are you okay with that, right? Yeah. 
Okay, yes, I'm okay with that. Okay, well, then we just got to revise our contract, sign it and all that. But you can't do anything sneaky, right? That's yeah, the thing. Yeah. You can't like not tell them and then all of a sudden you made another 2% on the back end. Like that's, that's bad, right? Don't do that. But if you're like, if legitimately it's an opportunity that can benefit the client and it benefits you at the same time and they know about it and it's transparent and they're willing to sign, and it's all good. Yeah, you could do that. Now, here's what I want you guys to know. This is something I found out earlier today. There are going to be attorneys trying to find people who are doing shady shit and they're going to be doing secret shopping. So you may get an attorney who calls a Zillow, clicks on it to see if you're following the rules and to catch you in the act. So if you're doing anything shady, guys, like there are going to be people who are going to be preying on shady agents to try to draft up lawsuits, right? The MLS, if you get in trouble, they're going to be fining people right? Finding people for stuff. Um, so like, there's no like shadiness around like that can happen. Right. Um, and so you want to make sure you're above board and you want to make sure you know that people are watching. Right. And you never know, right. There are attorneys out there who are just praying and just trying to make money off people. And like, they'll try to catch you up or whatever. And they'll try to maybe prey on people's uh, ignorance, maybe because it's new and you still don't fully know. And you say something wrong. And then all of a sudden you got a potential lawsuit, right? And so you got to be really careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Concession. Yeah. 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 That's that's that that's a good point that you brought up. So just to just so you guys to make it easy, is you can only say commission when you're referring to your principal client paying you a fee directly, right? So like if you represent the seller, seller's paying you a commission. If you represent the buyer, buyer's paying you a commission. The seller is not paying the buyer's agent a commission. So those are now separate. They can pay a concession, a credit basically towards the buyer's costs, but the commission is being charged from agent to client, right? To their principal, right? And so that that's the clarification there is, I know it's confusing, right? But concession is basically a credit, right? Another word used for credit. Commission is like, you're my client. We signed an agreement. You owe me a commission. That's it, right? Yeah. And so they're they're trying to separate the two, right? Because before it was all gray. Like we pay, the seller would pay commission to an agent. That agent would share commission with the buyer. It's no longer. It's now it's separate, right? I got my agent. You got your agent. You owe them a commission. These guys owe me a commission. Now, maybe we can negotiate that as a credit to help you cover that, right? So thanks for bringing that up, Tal. That's that's a good thing. And you will get in trouble and you'll get yourself in some sticky water if you're saying it the wrong way. Now, are people probably going to mess this up in the beginning? Yes, right? But this is why we're in the classroom. This is why we're educating ourselves, right? So it takes some time to get this stuff right. Uh, okay, so we answered specifying on the RPA. Um right? There's a section on the RPA that says credits for closing costs, right? Or concessions. So you can put seller to pay 3% concessions, right? You did that one. You were asking for a, a concession towards uh, the foundation or whatever, right? $23,000 concession. But in that same thing, you can put 3% concession. And then we know that you're going to work that out with the buyer, right? So that's where you put that out. So does that answer your, your question, right? Where to put it? Um, how is the fee negotiated between buyer, agent, and seller? We kind of covered that with what we talked about right now. When to secure the agreement. Now, this comes to strategy, right? So this is an important one as well. So it's going to be case by case, depending on the scenario of how you meet the client, right? And so when you, if you get like a internet lead or a Zillow lead or a first time lead, and you don't really know them yet, do you want to immediately hit them with like, hey, you got to sign in an agreement? No, right? So the strategy, and we're going to go over the script in a second, is 
let's say Zillow, right? Zillow or any sort of internet lead where they want to go see a property you guys haven't met yet. What you're going to do first is you're going to book the appointment, ALM, right? ALM is what you're going to do. The same way you've always done it. When you call them back to confirm, that's when you're going to bring up the agreement, right? It's on the callback, the confirmation. So no longer should you be like texting to confirm, right? You should be calling, right? And then that's when you can bring up, hey, I'm, and that's this the script we're going to go over right now. And I'm actually going to show you an example of how that script goes. Uh, ALM is appointment location motivation, right? So it's basically, that's kind of our, our uh, the acronyms for the Zillow script. So when you get a Zillow call in, this could be any sort of call in, right? This could be a person that hits you up on Facebook and they want to go see a property or they were referred to you. But basically, you always want to book the appointment first. Say, okay, hey, when do you want to see that property? Okay, 5 p.m. tomorrow. Great. I'll go ahead and confirm with the seller. Make sure we can get in. I'll give you a call back in a bit to confirm that we're good to go. That's A. Location. Hey, is this the only location you're looking in? Are there any other areas you're open to? Right? And then motivation. Hey, what, what attracted you to this property? Right? What are some of the things you're looking for in a home? And so those are the key things, right? The ALM. Now, when I call back for that uh, appointment, that's when I'm going to bring up, hey, has anybody updated you on what's happening with the new changes, you know, when it comes to buyers, agents and buyers, right? And so what I got for you guys, I'm gonna play a little video. And this is a really good video that I think you guys should watch the whole entire thing. But this last section is really good. And so this is the script that we're going to be using, especially on these, uh, like Zillow and kind of first time deals. Make sure you guys can hear. People, which is what most clients want anyway. So Tom, let's assume we got a um, we got a call, or we got we got an appointment to look at a home tomorrow at five o'clock, and then we'll we'll take it from there. So, yeah. ring, ring, ring. Hello, uh, Tom. Hi, it's Tom Tool here with uh, Remax Main Line. Just going to confirm our appointment for tomorrow at five o'clock over at one two three Banana Street. Wanted to make sure that's still working for you and Kathy. Absolutely, yes. We can't wait to see the house. Yeah, it looks like a nice place. I'm excited to show it to you as well. And, and I took the liberty of lining up a couple more that, that are similar to it. So we can kind of go over that when we get there. And if you don't like them, we don't have to go see them. But I wanted to show you all your options. Um, and I was just curious, Tom, has anyone taken the time to explain to you the changes that are taking place to touring homes and working with a buyer's agent like myself? No, but I mean, I've certainly read about some of the commission things that are changing, but, you know, just sort of high level. So now what, what do I need to know? Sure. Yeah. And, and, and um, I'm, I'm glad you told me you have a little understanding of it. That really helps. So yeah. the, the, the major change is that as of August 17th, uh, buyers and agents are now required to enter into a buyer agreement before touring any properties. Really? Usually we would do this when we were, yeah. And, and it's, it's obviously a big change for the industry as well. Normally we would do this when we're writing an offer or when we're, we're moving ahead. So the timing's changed a little bit. Um, so normally what we'll do is uh, obviously I'll meet with you and Kathy, go over everything. And uh, we normally we offer six for a 12 month contract and most people go with the shorter one and wanted to see uh, what, what term would work best for you. So, so six or 12 months, those are the two options. So it sounds like a lot and, yeah. and that, that's what we normally offer. And, and because of this new environment, uh, we, we've come up with a third option for, for folks that, because we haven't met yet. And I want to make sure you feel comfortable. I feel comfortable. Sure. Kathy feels comfortable. So um, we, we've got an option for like a property specific contract. Now, if you want to do that every time we go look at something, we'll have to sign a new agreement or we could do like a 30 day test drive. Uh, I, I don't know if you ever test drove a car before, but you kind of see how it works, make sure everything feels comfortable and then you can move ahead with a longer term commitment. Is that something you'd be open minded to? Yeah, I mean, I want to have a conversation with my wife about it, but I think kind of maybe the 30 day test drive probably is the, you know, at least the right move kind of out of the gate. Yeah, and, and I mean, I want to earn your business time. I want to be really clear. And if we want to go see some other properties, it, you know, it becomes pretty cumbersome to go look at these things, keep re-signing agreements. So, you know, best case, we help you find a great new home. Worst case, if you don't don't like me or don't think I'm the right person for the job, we can go our separate ways. And and, that, and that's that's totally cool. Again, we're here to earn your business. And I'm married too, so definitely talk with your wife. I totally get that. Love it. Okay, I think if the person listening right now, that's it. Simple, right? Was that pretty simple? I love that because it's simple, casual, and I want you guys to also understand 
the psychology behind it. He first said, normally what we do is a six month or a 12 month. So he already made it sound really high. Who's gonna wanna sign a six month and I just called you from Zillow? No, right? So he already knew that that was gonna be high, right? And so you kind of already put that in there so that you can show them a different option and they're gonna go, oh yeah, that's a better option. So you're also leading them to the option, right? And the key is you wanna get them to sign an agreement and it to not be a big deal, right? Not such a big commitment. And then the way he phrases it is like, hey, we could do a property specific, but hey, that just means every single time we see a house, we have to sign a new agreement. That could be pretty cumbersome. Or we do like a 30-day test drive. And then he even downplayed it, like a test drive. You know, have you ever test drove a car? You kind of test drive it, see if you like it. And then before you decide to make a formal commitment, right? Uh, so which one, you know, would you guys be open-minded to a 30-day test drive? And that's the script, right? So you get the Zillow, you book the appointment, ALM, you make sure it's available. You call them back to confirm, and then you hit them with that. That's the script. That's what we're going to be doing, right? Now, that's the scenario for I just met you or I just got the lead. I haven't met you yet. It's going to be a lot different when you actually get to sit down with them. You're doing a buyer console. You're able to go through the whole consultation, show them all your value. And then at the end, that's when you can kind of pitch them, hey, are we going to do a 90-day commitment, a 30-day, whatever it might be, right? But what I want to get to is a lot of times, I would say the majority of the time, it's going to start off this way. And so we're going to have to ease people into these agreements, right? And the 30-day test drive is a great way to get them to want to work with you. Because in 30 days, you can prove your value, right? It's going to be hard to prove your value in one, one meeting. I mean, you can. If you're really good, you're prepared. But 30 days, it's like, okay, you can show them a few homes, see if they like you, see if you like them but at least you got them to sign some sort of commitment for that 30 days, right? And hey, if, if I'm not the guy for the job or I'm not the right person, hey, no problem. You, you know, we can just cancel the agreement. Not a big deal, right? Any questions on, on the script? Um, so Zillow came out with their own kind of property specific version, but uh, the, sem the webinar I was on today with EXP, um, EXP knows that a lot, so a lot of the big teams are under EXP, right? And a lot of those teams are Zillow flex partners, right? So EXP has been like ahead of the game and EXP has been talking with Zillow and EXP came out with their own versions of these agreements and Zillow has given them hundred percent thumbs up on our agreements. So like they actually want people to follow the way that EXP is doing it. Right. Um, and so it's, uh, so yeah, it's basically going to be up to us to do it. Uh, Zillow stance is like, they don't care if you do a property specific or a 30 day or whatever you want to do, but strategy wise, does it make sense to try to pitch someone a six month or a 12 month off the first call? It doesn't. Right. And you're going to scare a lot of people away like that. So this is the strategy that we're going to roll with for the time being. And I think it's a great strategy and it's already working. Like people are already doing this. This guy, Tom tool runs a big team. They're already doing this like for months already. And they're like just signing agreements left and right. Um, the other thing, if you were to watch this full video, we're not going to watch it. I'll send you guys a link later. You should definitely watch it is any clients you currently are working with right now, any buyers you're currently showing homes to, they're going to have to sign an agreement. So you're going to have to go back to your buyers, the gold calls, the whoever, right? Hey, gold call, you know, has anybody told you about the new changes coming up? Right. You know, for us to continue to work together, this is what we got to do. Not a big deal. We're still going to show you homes. Everything's going to be the same. We just got to formalize that we're working together. That's all it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there's an amendment now. So any listings you currently have, there's an amendment or an addendum to the listing agreement that needs to be signed as of August 17th, right? So if your deal, uh, if it's not in contract yet, if it's in contract and it's whatever the current contract is, but if you have a, a listing signed coming soon, or even if it's just on the market, right? And then August 17th comes, you have to play by the new rules. So what we're doing now is we're going to have to go back to any listings we have and sign this amendment. And all the amendment does is just explains that the commissions are separate now. This is my fee for listing it. Commission to the buyer or concessions, right? Is going to be totally negotiable. The buyer is required to have their agent, right? And it's going to be negotiable at that point. And so we'll have uh, Melissa probably start sending those out, right? But it's going to be up to you guys to explain this stuff to your client. So they're not surprised when they get a DocuSign or something. Right. Yeah.
Yeah. So from what I understand and what I heard today is if the seller has given permission, right? It's up to the seller. If the seller's like, hey, I'll pay a 3% concession, right? Towards the buyer's cost, then it's open game. You could share that. You can tell whoever, you could text, call, email, because the seller is giving you permission saying, I'm willing to give a credit. Just like they would give a credit to fix the broken heater or the broken AC or whatever, right? Verbiage cannot be put on the MLS from what I understand. I don't know. That's going to be up to the local MLS. Um, the commission field is going to be deleted for sure. But are they going to allow you to say concessions? I don't know. Uh, because if you think about it, are you allowed to say concessions right now? Like, hey, or in the private remarks, seller will give a credit towards the leaky pool. Yeah, you could do that, right? And so you may be able to do that in the private remarks, but we'll have to verify with the with the MLS, right? But I don't see why you wouldn't be able to say seller is willing to pay concessions. Yeah. Be yeah, seller is open to con concessions. It's negotiable. Submit your offer, right? Like, I don't think you're doing anything wrong by doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can say, Hey, my fee is 3%, right? That's what I charge. We can negotiate with the seller to give you a credit to cover some of your costs, right? Because you don't just have my fee. You have your closing costs, title, escrow. You have all these costs, right? Those all get added to a total, right? And so we can try to ask for a credit as part of your offer to cover, to offset these costs, including my commission, right? And so, do we? That's all part of the negotiations, right? It's like, it's like, um, just, just to make it easy. It's like when you call the agent and say like, hey, what price what price do I need to submit to make it win? Well, they're going to say, some of them will tell you. And some of them will just say, well, just give me your best offer and then I'll let you know, right? Or I got four offers, submit your best offer and we'll negotiate. So it's all going to be part of the negotiations, right? Now, can you upfront say, hey, you know, is the seller willing to give concessions? The agent could say yes or no, but if you give them a good offer and you're asking for a credit and it makes sense and it gives them enough money to make the deal happen, they're not going to turn it down. The the listing agent is legally obligated to present the offer to their client, right? So I wouldn't even really ask. I would just submit my offer and put it in the offer. Yeah, why not? Because you got you to gotta figure that other people are going to include it. It's really going to come down to a net proceeds, right? Yeah. And then, you know, it's like, it's like anytime you ask for a credit for closing costs, right? Like we've asked for credit for closing costs before. Like let's not overcomplicate it, right? It's just a credit for closing costs. That's really what it is, right? And so if you ask for a credit, the seller may say, okay, your offer is great. The credit's fine. It makes sense. I'm getting a good deal. My net proceeds is better than the other offers. Yes. Or they may say, hey, if you want that credit, come up additional on your price. And then we offset it that way, right? And so that's all part of the negotiations, basically. Yeah, it's just, just negotiate it. Now, if you're representing your buyer, your job is to protect your buyer and try to get them the best deal. So when you submit your offer, I would say, let's ask for the credits on the offer. So here's here's what's going to be the best recommendation to, to solve that issue, right? is we need to shift them from talking about theory of credits and how much am I paying and work with the net sheets, 
right? So if you're going to go list property, you got to bring net sheets, right? Bring net sheets and give them different scenarios. Hey, if your house sells for a million and we don't have to pay any concessions, this is how much you net. If it sells for a million and we got to pay a 3% concession, this is how much you net. If you were to net this amount, this sort of ballpark, is that enough for you to sell your home and get to the next place that you got to get to, right? So we got to get people out of like talking about percentages and all that and focus on net proceeds, net proceeds, right? Exactly. Did you already kind of show the worst case scenario? Uh, let me see. Questions. Rob, did you have a question? I don't know. Rob said he had his hand up. I don't know. You're muted. If anybody do, has a I question, do, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Um, so so there used to be like a maximum amount, a maximum amount that the lender is, is willing to uh, to give back. Like I had some files in the past where like we we always asked for some credit or some concessions back and they all would the, the lender would always cut us down and said, nope, the max amount that you're able to get back is this amount of dollars. Right. So my question is, is what happens? Like, let's say for there's certain there are certain repairs that need to be done to the property. Right. And then we're not dealing with small money around here. We're dealing with big money. Right. So, you know, three percent of a, of a million, that's like 30 grand right off the bat. And then add on top of that, you know, maybe some 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 seller credits back where we're fixing uh, the property, right? Um, my question is, is the lender going to cut us off as far as, nope, this is the maximum amount of money that you can get back or that we're willing to to make this deal happen? Uh, I, I see there are issues in that end. Do, do you do you or or what do you think? From my understanding, I know back in the day that used to be an issue. But from my understanding, nowadays, you can credit up to like nine or 10 percent of the purchase price. Um, and the lender doesn't care. It just has to appraise, right? The house has to appraise. Um, so I don't think that's an issue no more. I don't think they cap you anymore. And I'd rather us not like go into the weeds of all these what if scenarios. Like you'll have to just cross those bridges when you get there, right? To make the deals work. And I think that's what it's going to require for us to now think a little bit, put our thinking hats on, try to problem solve, figure out these deals. But I don't think you're going to run into that problem um, because I don't think the amount of concessions are going to be that high where it like violates any lender rules and i and my understanding is it's they let you credit a lot more nowadays i've heard up to like nine or ten percent so if you're getting three percent credit towards your commission and then you still got six percent more to play around with on a million dollar deal nine percent is ninety thousand dollars that should be plenty to cover any sort of negotiations right i think it'll be a very very rare circumstance where you're like you hit the limit and like you can't make the deal work uh, good question though. Um, okay. So to clear, to just to clarify, right. When are we securing this agreement? We're securing, we have to secure an agreement before we tour any home, right? So you're not going to want to pitch a long-term agreement. If it's the first time you're talking to this client, if it's a Zillow call or a first time interaction, you're going to want to, Hey, has anybody, you're going to use the script that we just talked about. Right. And you're going to want to probably pitch them like the 30 day test drive or the single property, but shy away from the single property. Why? Because it's better, it's in your favor to get a 30 day agreement, right? If you like only drill the single property and then you open the door and then you never talk to them again, will there be some clients that don't want to sign a 30? Probably, right? But it's up to you to be the salesperson and say like, well, here's why, right? Like one property isn't going to really give us enough time to get to know each other, see if we're a good fit, there's good chemistry. So what we recommend is a 30 day test drive. Also, we don't want to have to sign an agreement every single time we go see a house. If I see four houses, we got to sign four different agreements. It's kind of, it's kind of cumbersome, right? So let's just do a 30 day test drive and, you know, see how we work together. If in that 30 days we decide we're not a good fit, no problem. You know, we're free to let you go. Right. And then tie it down. Is that, is that fair, Mr. Client? Or is a 30 day test drive something you'd be open-minded to, right? So remember, this is where your sales skills need to come into play, right? You got to close them at the end. Hey, is that fair, Mr. Client? Or is the 30-day test drive something you're open-minded to? Or can you see why a 30-day test drive would be beneficial for you? That's me like tying them down, going for the close, right? Don't just like leave it up in the air, right? You you got to show them like you're confident in what you're, what you're saying. Um, let's see. Okay, good. What else do we got? 
uh, we, for the sake of time, we may have to turn this into like a part two, but I think here's what I want you guys to take away is a lot of, a lot of this guys, it's not the paperwork, it's the sales aspect, right? The paperwork is the paperwork. It's super easy, right? Um, and we can do, pro we'll probably end up having, because we're coming up on time, we'll probably end up having another training where we can just go through the co the contracts, but the way the contracts are are done now, they're super simple. So like this is the single single property, right? So if the client only wants to do a one property agreement, it's literally one page. It's like, it's easy. You write the property address, you write the length of the agreement, uh, you write the fee, right? 3% or whatever it is, any additional terms and you sign it. It's like, it's not rocket science, right? Like you guys can all figure that out. That's not the hard part. The hard part is just explaining it and getting them to want to agree to it. Signing the paperwork, that's just, that's the easy part. Um, but make sure you're reading this, right? So, you know, and even if it's your first time, right? Like, this is what I would do. If it was my first time, I'd read it a couple of times before I go on the appointment. And then while I'm in the appointment, I'm just kind of reading and explaining to them. Like I'm smart enough to explain what properties, what length of an agreement means, right? And so this is the, the longer term buyer broker agreement and it's only two pages, right? And all it does is covers which properties you're gonna show them or what area or what, what this agreement covers. So it can cover like residential, commercial, it can, cover any property in Santa Clara County, right? Pretty much the area or properties, the length of the agreement, right? If you're doing a three month agreement, you would put it, it ends three months from now. Um, then you can list those right there. Yeah. No, you wanna be specific, right? And so that is something they talked about. You can't just like any property. It should say like residential property, you know, in it's wherever you're going to be able to service them, whether it's through you or it's like you refer it out or whatever, like just try to make it specific. Right. But what you don't want to do is like, if you know, they're looking in San Jose and you're like any property in the world, like, okay. You, <laughs> right. Like, because then like, if, if you ever went to court and they're going to look at that, they're going to go like, come on, any property in the world, like that doesn't make sense. Right. Like you could add zip. I would encourage you to add cities or counties because then you cover a broader range. But Bay Area, now Bay Area could be up to interpretation, right? Is Sacramento Bay Area? Some people in SAC represent the Bay. I don't know, right? Like that's the thing, right? It's like, oh no, you're not Bay Area. You're the Valley. No, we're not, right? We're on this side of the bridge. Like that's where you don't want to get, right? So put counties, put state, right? Anywhere in California. Like if you know, they might, they might move, they either might buy here or they might buy in LA and you're going to help them with those two deals, right? Then put California because then it applies to their situation, right? So use like common sense guys, like logic, right? And cover yourself by putting a broader area, like the County or the city or multiple cities, right? Yeah. Yeah, but that's where it's up to you guys to ask those questions up front, right? Like, hey, what areas are you looking in that I can service you? And so it's better to ask those questions up front and put them, but can you amend it? Like if all of a sudden they decide they're gonna go look somewhere else that you guys never talked about, then say, hey, let's just go ahead and add this to our list, right? It's, you can go amend it after. Write it in there, initial it, have them initial it, so we're all good to go. Um, and so all you gotta really fill out is the area or the properties, the length of the agreement, all these other things are just kind of standard stuff. Just saying agency disclosure, that's a separate agency disclosure. When you write the offer, your efforts are all going to be in good faith. It's basically letting them know like, hey, if you see a property, let me know. Um, also, you're asking, do they have any other agreements signed with anybody else? Right? Because they could say, hey, I do have an agreement signed, but it's only for LA. And, but I want to use you for Bay Area. Right? Okay, well, I need to know that. Right? Because I don't want to step on any toes. So do you have any other agreements signed with anybody else is an important question to ask. And, and then if they do, then you need to know specifically where that agreement's at, right? Because you don't want to get in a situation where you're fighting. Are we limiting this to one to four units? Five plus will not be included in this requirements or because we're part of association? That's a great question, Amish. I don't know the answer to that. If it's just one to four units or if it's any, 
Um, but if we look at the top, it does say residential, commercial, land, and all that. So with that being said, uh, commercial would be five or more units. So I'm assuming it's going to be any property. Um, but if you know this person's looking at like different types of property, that's where you got to just get clear on the conversation, right? Because maybe you're not a commercial specialist, right? And like, there's no point in locking them into a deal with you for a commercial if you're not going to be able to service them for a commercial, right? And say, hey, if, instead, let me connect you with my partner at eXp who specializes in commercial, and then you work out a referral with that, that person, right? And so as long as you guys are trying to like make this fair across, on both sides, right, for the buyer and for you, you shouldn't have any, any issues. Um, broker fee. This is where you put your fee, right? If it's a percentage or if it's a flat fee, but here's, here's the good thing right here. It actually says, so like the test drive, the 30 day test drive would be on this document. It says right here, collecting broker fee from seller. So it already says on there, credit to buyer at closing buyer may choose to negotiate that the broker fee be paid in whole or in part through a seller credit to the buyer. So the good thing is it already has the verbiage so that you can explain it to them, right? You're not having to remember it. If you just read through the, the deal, it shows it there. And direct seller broker compensation, right? So buyer authorizes broker EXP to request that the broker fee be paid in whole or in part by the seller. So we can have a direct, like an off-market property. We can have this direct uh, the thing that I talked about on Tuesday. It's a, just a direct agreement. We don't represent the seller, but they agree to pay us 3% if we bring a buyer, right? So there's, there's that document as well. Any additional terms, if there's anything you want to exclude on here, anything like that, either party may cancel effective upon delivery of written notice. So they can cancel. That's the other thing is while the agreement's in place, you guys are locked. But if we just, if they decide, hey, like I want to cancel with you, like you got to let them cancel, right? We're not going to like lock anybody like, no, you can't work with anybody else, right? Like, right? Like, but remember, you're not going to have people wanting to cancel if you do a good job. If you do a good job and you're in touch with them and you're giving them value and you're working for them, right? They're not going to want to cancel with you, right? Like 99% of the time, right? I know there's just, there's some jerks, right? Out there. But, and if they want to cancel, then they got to let you know in writing. And then you can say, hey, before we cancel, like, what can we do to remedy this? Because I really like to work with you. Okay, we can't remedy this. Okay, no problem. You can cancel, right? Good riddance. I'd rather work with people who want to work with me. Um, okay, how are we doing on time? 12.57. So what we're going to do, I don't have enough time to go through the listing agreement, but it's in there in those documents that I sent you. It's only four pages, guys. Super simple. We'll do another training on just the listing agreement part. But with what we covered today, you should now know the biggest part of it is the fees are separate, right? So when you're explaining it to a client on a listing, hey, this is my fee for listing your property. Anything that gets paid to the buyer on their side, that's all going to be negotiable. Now, the question yesterday that your, your client asked, right? Well, why don't we just not pay them anything, right? And so it's not a question of like, how much do we pay them? It's the question is, should we pay them? Should you pay somebody to make them want to bring an offer to your, to your house, right? If the neighbor lists their home for sale and they're offering to work with the buyer and give concessions towards the closing costs and you're not, and you guys have the same home, where do you think the agents are going to push the buyers or where do you think the buyers are going to want to go? So it's not that how much do you pay them? It's should you pay them to make your home more marketable, right? But remember, the reason you're hiring me is I'm going to negotiate the best price and best terms. So at the end of everything, whether you pay them or not, you walk away with the most money. That's why you hire me, right? Whether it's a 2% concession or a one or a zero, your net, the check that you bring home from title is going to be more with me because of my negotiation skills. That's why we work together. And then we'll cross those bridges as we get there. My fees 3%, we'll cross all the other bridges as the offers come in. It'll be a case by case where we negotiate each offer. Does that make sense, Mr. Client, right? And they're like, yeah, shoot, cool. Right. And then I, I, I even asked the client, well, Hey, if someone gave you like a really, really good offer, like it was like a really high offer, but they're asking for 2%, are you going to deny it? They're like, no, as long as it makes sense. 
exactly. So let's not put ourselves, let's not put ourselves in a hole, right? Let's not, you know, let's not tie our hands. Let, let's just keep it open based off the offers. Let's see where the offers come in and let's work that out and let's negotiate. Fair? Boom. And they were like, all right, cool. No big deal. Like we spent like a little bit of time on that, explained it to them, gave them the example. And then it was like, all right, cool. You know, and we're collecting the 3% commission on our end for the listing. Um, okay. Yeah. So that one this morning at eight by EXP, um, they're going to send the link. I should be getting the link today. So I'll post those in Slack and I'll also put those like in the tools thing. Cause those will be on their YouTube channel, but those are really good videos. They go into more detail of some of these scenarios. I covered a lot of what they covered, but there's probably other things that, um, you know, other scenarios that they've covered. And so I'd encourage you to watch those. They're really good. Um, and then I also just want to reiterate guys that our CEO, Leo, um, this guy's like all over this, right? Like I'm, I'm like super impressed that like how agile EXP is. Like they're like coming up with documents. They're like, he's on Tom Ferry. He's talking to Zillow. Like he's out there like paving the way for like how this new market's going to work with these changes. And so it's, it's really, uh, reassuring that we're, we're in the right spot guys. Like these guys are moving quick, right? So that our business doesn't skip a beat. But it's our responsibility as agents and as business owners to make sure we show up, make sure we take this stuff serious, make sure we ask questions, make sure we study, make sure we practice so that we could be prepared, right? We're not fumbling it when we're out there with clients, right? Uh, that's the biggest thing. Okay. Do we got, uh, okay. uh, um, yes. All right, here, I got a question. I, uh, I read the the listing agreement um, a couple of days ago, um, uh, and but, but I didn't read the XP ones yet. I read out the, the, the car form, wind forms. In there, when we're having a, a, a talk about concessions, not commissions, concessions, is there, do we write this on the listing agreement? Uh, because I didn't see a spot, or are we marking this as under others? And then writing down, uh, how do we identify that that concessions will be given out or do we just do it like we did with with uh, with regular listings as far as like a credit back on, on the private remarks? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah. my advice I'd give to you, number one, is if you can, if, if it's not too late, download this listing agreement because it's a lot easier than the car one, to be honest. This is only four pages and it's really easy. If you just read it like one or two times in your car, you'll probably you'll get the hang of it because you've done other listings. But then to answer the main part of your question is that is up to you. If you want to already establish up front, seller is willing to pay X percent commission uh, concessions, you can write that in the agreement. Or if you want to say, hey, Mr. Seller, we'll just kind of take it case by case as the offers come in, that's fine too, right? Yeah, you would write it on additional terms, um, which Mai just pointed out. So on, yeah, whether it's, uh, is that on the FAQ sheet? Is that what you're looking at, the FAQ sheet? Yeah. So on this FAQ sheet right here, Rob, this is the one where all those like specific questions, they answer them in here. So I would read this FAQ sheet and then there's a section in here. What page is it, Mai? Page three where it says, should I disclose that seller is willing to give concessions? And it, is, it, it says, with their written permission, yes. So if your seller like on, in the listing appointments, like, hey, I'm fine, I'll give concessions, right? Um, you can put this in the additional terms. And then example is just seller is willing to offer seller concessions. You can leave it just general like that, right? Seller is willing to offer X in seller concessions. All seller concessions are negotiable. Seller is willing to consider compensation to a buyer broker, or you can write sellers willing to consider X towards a buyer broker fee. All terms are negotiable. But if you really think about it, guys, at the end of the day, it's all negotiable anyways. So even if the seller says, I'm willing to offer concessions, you're still going to have to negotiate. That doesn't, it doesn't say like unlimited concessions. And even if you write an amount, like sellers willing to offer 2%, but then they get like an offer 300 grand over asking and they want 3%, is the seller going to turn it down? Right. So I almost feel like writing this in there is kind of like 
you're writing it in there, but it doesn't really make sense to write it anyways, other than just to have the conversation with the seller. I just keep it really general. Don't limit yourself to like a number, um, but definitely have the conversation, right? Have the conversation is the most important part and keeping it general because it will be case by case, right? What if you get an offer and they're not asking for any concessions? Because like the buyer, they're trying to make their offer really strong and the buyers are really going to pay their agent. And like the seller's not going to have to give up whatever percentage they put in there, right? So that, that's why like, I wouldn't like pigeonhole myself, right? I would keep it general, but you have to have the conversation because you don't want them to be surprised when a, an offer comes in asking for X amount or X amount of concessions. Okay. You guys got like five, 10 more minutes, guys, to practice the script really quick. All right. I'd rather at least get one one run in. Right. So what I did is I printed out the script for everybody. Um, and I'd rather just even if you guys like you do it once, you do it once. Right. It'll take like five minutes. But I want you guys to be able to have the script. I don't want it to be the first time you guys ever get it. Um, if anybody even wants to come up and do it live up here. But this is basically, I took the script from that guy, Tom, and I just kind of shortened it a little bit and just, you know, and the words that I put in bold, those are basically like the main points of the script, right? And so really quick, first part, hey, hey, it's Tom with PRG or your Zillow Premier agent, whatever you want to say. Just call in and confirm our appointment for tomorrow at five over at 123 Main Street. Want to make sure that still is going to work for you. Buyer confirms. Okay, great. It looks like a nice property. I'm excited to show it to you. I also pulled up a few other properties. We can see those if you have some time. And then the main thing in bold, what I wrote right here, this is the main part, right? This is the part that you got to get down. I'm just curious, Tom, has anybody taken the time to explain to you the changes that are taking place when touring homes and working with the buyer agent? That's the main point of this script, right? You got to make sure you say that part. If you tweak it a little bit, just don't tweak that part, right? Uh, and then listen to what they have to say, right? So just pause and listen. Yeah, I've heard a bit. Yeah, I don't really know. Yeah, I know a little bit. Okay, great. Well, let me just explain to you really quick. As of August 17th, buyers and agents are now required to enter into an agreement before touring any homes. It's a big change for our industry. Normally, we would meet first, go through everything, and then sign an agreement later on. But it's now the new rules, right? And um, normally once we meet, we either, uh, and everything's good, we offer a six month or a 12 month contract. Most people go with the shorter one. Um, do you know which would be better for you, a six month or a 12 month? I'm already just doing that just because I already know they're gonna say it's long, right? Wait to hear their response. Oh, six month or 12 month, right? Yeah, six months. Okay, yeah, six months. If they say six months, all right, cool. It's a six month one, right? <laughs> right. But if they're like, oh, that's kind of long, right? I haven't even met you yet, right? Like, hey, look, at those are normally, that's the old kind of normally how we do it. But because of this new environment, because of these changes, we've come up with a couple other options just because we haven't really met. We want to make sure you feel comfortable with us. And so what we do is we have two options. Number one is a property specific contract, right? Where every time we see a home, we got to sign a new contract. That kind of gets a little cumbersome, right? Especially if we go look at a few properties. Or what people mostly like is a 30-day test drive. So I'm really pushing the 30-day test drive. 30-day test drive, just kind of like when you test drive a car. You ever test drove a car before, Dan? Yeah, yeah. You know, test drive it, see if you like it, see if it fits good, and then you can decide if you want to make a formal commitment, right? Um, and just to be clear, like, I want to earn your business. I want to make sure you feel comfortable. Um, you know, best case scenario, we find you home. Worst case, if I'm not the right fit, you know, it's no problem. You know, we can go our separate ways. So is the 30-day 30 30 test drive something you guys would feel comfortable with? And that's pretty much the script. It's not that hard, right? It's like super chill, super casual, but this is a script you're going to be using guys when you show a flex over and over and over. So like you need to memorize the foundation of the script, make it your own and hit the key points. So what I want you guys to do right now, we'll give it five minutes and then we're done. Uh, we'll two minutes on each side, give the script to the other person and then switch. See if you guys can get a couple in, in five minutes, right? Just grab a partner. We'll put five minutes. Those of you guys at home, uh, 
Practice, just practice saying it out loud. Uh, the link to all of these docs, guys, is in our tools page. So tools.realestateprg.com. When you go to our tools page, which is this, you'll scroll down and you'll see a buyer broker script. I put it in two different places. Buyer broker script here. If you click on that link, it takes you to the script. Or if you go down foundational training, buyer broker script right here. So that's where the script's at. <laughs> you might have some people honestly that just like because you presented it so well well six months fine right yeah but if you're if if you even want to stop in like six or 12 months yeah i know that's kind of long you know but because of this new environment here's the other options that people mostly like right so you could even just push the 30 day if you want or if you just stop and they're like, hey, six months, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could even say, okay, great. Hey, so when I meet you at the property, I'll bring the, I'll bring the document. Yeah. We'll just sign it real quick and then we'll, we'll tour the property. Right. Because remember when you show up to the house, you can't open the door unless they sign this. Right. So it's like, versus you send it to their inbox and then they're like, Oh, let me think about it or anything like that. You know? So yeah. Well, that's why that's why on the agreement, if you notice, it has that part where it says you give us permission to ask the seller to pay for that for you, right? Like, hey, look, you're not obligated to buy any property, right? But I do, I am obligated to tell you what our fee is, right? That's just that's the rules, that's the law, right? So my fee is three percent. But what we would do is like, if you really like this home, we're gonna create an offer and ask the seller to pay for it on your behalf, right? So we could try to roll that all into the offer, and so. If it makes sense, we move forward. If it doesn't, you don't. You're not obligated to move forward with the property. Sound fair? I mean, I guess technically you can, but do we want to get into like charging people like to, for each? Yeah, I would shy away from that. I'm sure there's gonna be some some like brokerages that build their whole model around like this is charging for to show at each house yeah you know but i wouldn't i wouldn't want to run my business like that i would just like i'd rather i'd want to build that long-term relationship and i want to go after the big commission the percentages right technically you're not supposed to but like to charge an upfront fee like that for a service that opens up more gray area because then they would have to pay the broker and then the broker would have to take a split and all that. Like if you don't even want to get into that. Yeah. yeah. Cause you're, you're legally not allowed to just collect money. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like you get in trouble, big trouble. Yeah. There, I was hoping you would cover that with us. 
but are you doing so? What's your take on it? I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I wouldn't do it, bro. Okay. Like we're not in the business of making hundred bucks, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm trying to make the three percent, the three percent on two million, right? I would first decide if I want to work with that client by asking the questions, you know, before I even start pitching them on like my services. So, yeah, that's what I would do. Amish, we're all set, Amish. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end, but definitely practice everything on your own. And then we'll continue to do some more training.